Valley Farm is about uh, 50, 60 miles east of Kansas City, and several years ago I went to one of Dr. Pinero's uh, conferences on perimeter trap crops and using trap crops to, uh, and beneficial insect crops to bring insects to an area where you can use a minimum amount of pesticides to kill the bad insects. So at that point we do free range chickens, so I got a concept that could we use the chickens to kill the pest. Uh, and bring them into that point rather than using pesticides and completely eliminate pesticides because we use, uh, we do an all-natural uh, vegetable uh, farmer's market business. So that's how we came to the concept of doing this. Uh, so our, tra our um, perimeter beneficial insect crop was sorghum sedan grass, buckwheat, and millet. And we planted it, uh, you can see the See, this is the buckwheat in bloom. The millet is here, it hadn't quite come on yet, and this is sorghum sedan grass. Now you can use fennel, dill, yarrow, coriander, tansy, buckwheat millet. Uh, they all attract ladybugs, uh, lace wings, uh, hoverflies, parasitic mini wasp, and tachneid flies. These are all beneficial to your garden. These are the good bugs that kill uh, all the bad bugs. And uh, Dr. Pinero is going to really address the bugs. Um, he can identify them, I can't. <laughs> um, prior to putting in our, our beneficial insect perimeter, um, we had two or three ladybugs a year. Hardly ever seen ladybug. After we put this in, we had ladybugs everywhere. And then, uh, this is the millet just when it was about to burst, the heads were about to burst. So this was uh, late July, I believe. This was a drought year, so our sorghum sedan grass was really put in uh, more as a, as a wind buffer uh, rather than anything else. But it was supposed to be about seven feet high, so the, the drought really hurt this. But a really interesting thing happened. These are the parasitic mini wasps, and as, as I was mowing these uh, access things at a point, I was being swarmed, and I mean swarmed to the sky was black with uh, these, these little bugs and I thought they were gnats. I didn't know what they were. So that's the back of my hand. Uh, that's a bug. I took a picture. I sent it to Jacob Wilson, which is was the, uh, uh, the grad student on this project. And I said, are these good or bad? Should I kill them? What should I do? And he said, no, that's fantastic. He said, if you have a few of those, uh, how many do you have? And uh, that's a good thing. And I said, well, I stopped counting at about a billion. Should I just keep going? Because I, I kid you not, it was a cloud. When I mowed through the grass, it was just a cloud of these bugs. So it was a uh, plus the ladybugs and some other beneficial bugs that were killing potato bugs. Uh, so these perimeter uh, beneficial insect crops were really, really successful. So how did I, I put this in, you just use what you have because I have no money. Um, this, these are my gardens and at this point I had in winter rye as a cover crop. So I tried to get the beneficial insect crop in as soon as I possibly could to get it started before the gardens went in. So I used a four foot rototiller and went all the way around the garden uh, about uh, 15 feet out from the gardens. Uh, and then you can see here as it's going up. The way I uh, planted mine is I have an old horse-drawn uh, wheat drill, yeah, which you probably won't have. But the good thing about the old horse-drawn wheat drill is you can do four foot, you can turn four foot on and four foot off in sections. And I just dumped it, I just dumped the three grains in there in piles and it will feed itself in the proper, uh, about two rows each. So it worked excellent. Uh, I'm sure that you could use just a standard drill. The only problem is you normally can't shut off half of it. But 
I just chose four foot because I had a four foot teller and I could do that. But six foot, eight foot, yeah, I don't think there's any magic number in terms of getting that together. Um, then we moved on to the the uh, sacrificial insect plants. These are blue hubbards, and they are like putting up a magnet uh, for um, cucumber beetles and squash bugs. So the concept that I got from Jaime is you put these in at the quarter at the outside corners of your vegetable production, and they attract uh, just literally thousands of uh, beetles and squash bugs. So this is uh, what a mature plant looks like. That's a bloom. That's what a small squash look like. Looks like they get about this big if you can ever get them to maturity without spraying them. Uh, and if you've ever had Gerber baby food, that's what you ate. So our our concept was we put in a couple of, of beds of the uh, blue hubbards, and we put the chicken tractor on top of that, and let the squash bugs go to that point, and then have the chickens eat the squash bugs off of the plants rather than spraying. Them. Now, Jaime, the research Jaime has done, you're basically doing the same thing, except you would come in here and this is where you would spray. So you're only spraying at four points in your garden to kill uh, all your bugs. So you grossly reduce your pesticide, plus you don't have any pesticides on your vegetables. So it's really a win-win situation. Uh, because this was a grant, I had to do a few things different. So uh, one of which was the chicken tractors, how the chicken tractors were constructed. Uh, our original concept is I put in two sections of, of the blue hubbards. Uh, but initially I thought that the chickens would scratch them out even though we started them in the greenhouse and got them up about this high. I thought the chickens would probably destroy those so my concept was we'll start one here, let it get established, put the chickens there and as they kill them we'll have this one going and then we can move the chicken tractor back and forth. The other problem I had was because it was a grant, I had to do a daily inspection of the plants. Uh, the Lincoln University people had to come out and do an inspection of the plants. So we had to be able to get to them. We had to be able to move that chicken tractor easily on and off of it uh, and do inspections of the plant. So I, I did, uh, I tested kind of two designs of chicken tractors. You can see the two here. The main difference between them is how I did the wheels. Um, these wheels are adjustable height, so you could raise it up a foot high and roll it over anything. Uh, in retrospect, I really didn't have to do that because it rolled so easily that uh, my 100-pound wife could push it around and push it back and forth unless it was really wet. But this chicken tractor, it provides uh, shelter uh, from the sun. There's an egg uh, laying nest. There, inside of that, there's a roosting bar. And then the ends fold up here so that we can fold the ends up and roll it off of the plants without destroying the plants. So that, that was the big problem, is how do we get this off of it without uh, destroying these plants, because they get about that high. So those were the two concepts. If you're doing this, you don't necessarily need to be able to roll that back and forth a couple times a day. Um, and I'll show you an, another alternative that I came up with. Uh, if you've ever had any kind of squash, this is what you end up with. Um, initially I had a problem and I was very upset because this is what I was getting and we weren't, I wasn't getting the pest control that I had hoped for. What we determined and the reason you do a grant is so I can stand up here and tell you what not to do because that was a stupid idea. Um, so then you won't make the same mistake. Our problem was we have a lot of coyotes, foxes and stuff. so. We have, uh, our chicken house has a concrete uh, foundation, so they can't get into it. So we were taking the chickens, letting them out, we free range. So we'd let them out of the chicken house in the morning, feed them. We would take two, put them in the chicken tractors, leave them in there until 4 or 5 o'clock, let them out with the rest of the flock, and then feed them and put them back up at night. The problem with that is the squash bugs and everything come out and feed on the dew and lay their eggs, and then they go back down in the ground. So they weren't available total control uh, at the time that the chickens were in there because the chickens were in there you know, in the middle of the day. So that ended up being my biggest mistake is I wasn't getting good pest control. So I determined that if you're going to use this method, the chickens have to be in there. You have to, you have to put the chickens in there so you can 
protect them, uh, and they can be out at sunrise and there, stay there until sunset. Uh, we also found out our uh, chickens, our layers, we put, uh, we buy new chickens every, uh, every year. We do a third of them, and we rotate uh, each year. We found out the younger chickens, they spent their whole day just going around the perimeter of the chicken tractor trying to figure out how to get out. We take a three or four year old hen, put her in there, and they were much, much better. They would peck around. I also couldn't see, you know, you see them peck down in, in the weeds. You don't know if they're pecking at a rock or you know, are they actually getting a bug. So that was kind of a problem. I really resolved that issue at one point uh, to see what they're eating. Because I went out and caught a mayonnaise jar full of um, squash bugs and beetles. And I took them up on the driveway, on the concrete driveway where I could see it and called the chickens over there. Our chickens are like pets. So and then I opened the uh, mayonnaise jar and dumped it out on the concrete pavement. Before I could grab the video camera, all the bugs were gone. So I don't have a video of that, but they, they definitely were eating. So that was my point there. Uh, I'm hoping to reconstruct this experiment using uh, some of the knowledge that I learned and get a little more specific data. Uh, we did do some experimentation with uh, ghost pepper spray doesn't have a lot to do with this, but we had a whole bunch of ghost peppers left over um, from the drought year. So I made an emulsion out of them and sprayed these, bug, these eggs, and the ones I tested never hatched. So that's back to, to Jaime's uh, original concept of this, is you have the trap crops, or the, the sacrificial crops, at the corner points, so you're spraying it there, and you don't have to uh, spray the rest of your All the information on, on this grant is on our website in addition to the SARE website. I have some additional stuff that I couldn't upload to their site. Um, I have the daily logs broke down in parts one and two. And I have a summary of the whole project. I have a lot of pictures. And I have the original grant proposal. I uh, have cost analysis of that chicken tractor and some instructions on how to build it if you wanted to use that just out in like a pasture area, uh, that concept. Um, I have some information on the cover crop and uh, some links to some of the SARE information. So then initially if you go to the summary page, there's a breakdown by quarters. So you can see exactly what we ended up with each day. There's another blue covered squash plant. Um, kind of a summary is perimeter trap crops are 100% success story. I, I actually could not believe how many beneficial insects uh, that they brought in and how the Blue Hubbards uh, attracted the squash bugs. We also tried red curry, but the Blue Hubbards are hands down better at attracting the, the, the red curry did, but we, we intermixed the red curry and the Blue Hubbards and they totally went to the Hubbards. So um, if you did the red curry by themselves, I'm sure they would be somewhat effective uh, this is a very, very good method for alternative pest control if you're organic uh, or all natural. Uh, basically reduces your pesticide usage. Um, it was a great success. This is going to be my second experiment because what I explained to you about keeping the chickens in there all the time. So what I'm going to do next time is put the chicken house, put a chicken house in the uh, perimeter. So within that perimeter, I'm going to put a um, chicken fence on each side of it, put all my gardens and my greenhouse and everything are in the center. So at that point, then I'm going to put the buckwheat and the millet, the yarrow and tansy, blue cupboards, and then uh, we've been planting cherry tomatoes uh, for the chickens to free range on, just sacrificial for them. So that's going to be my mix in this perimeter, 10 foot or 12 foot perimeter that I'm going to put around our entire vegetable. So I think this is more a more effective way to do it for an actual farm production where you're not having to count the bugs every day and do a lot of uh, research on it. Um, it doesn't take that many chickens either. Uh, two chickens in that chicken tractor cleaned it up. Uh, two chickens can put away a lot of bugs. 
Yes. My name is Jaime Piñero, and I want to spend just five minutes uh, providing an overview of what a trap cropping uh, approach is for pest management. At Lincoln University, we have been conducting uh, research and demonstrations for five years. And the goal is not just to focus on one insect. You can see that we're trying to uh, address multiple pests using uh, trap cropping. Well, as part of cultural controls, as part of uh, IPM in organic systems or in uh, conventional systems, I will focus on trap cropping, but you already know that there are so many things that you can do as part of cultural controls to uh, manage the soil and bring beneficial insects or control pests. Just to the point that blue hover has been shown to be an excellent trap crop in research done in Massachusetts, in Missouri, in Iowa, Dr. Mark Lisson from Iowa State, he has been also doing the same kind of research. Blue hover squash is very, very attractive to all these pests, especially when they're small. Because when you have these seedlings, let's say two week old, these plants have high concentrations of chemicals, which are called cucurbitaceans. Now, those chemicals are super attractive to cucumber beetles and to squash bugs. As the plants grow, what, is, what becomes very attractive are the flowers. And I have a lot of pictures to show, but I only have five minutes. So basically, it was known that they were attracted to these pests, but we were also, we showed in five years uh, of research that it's actually attracting more than just one or two. And there is evidence, but I don't have enough information because we don't have high populations of this squash vine border. But there is um, evidence showing that it could work. Blue hover squash can be used to attract also squash vine border. The key is that you have to have the seedlings in advance. So you have to have some additional planning. And I will show you how we have been doing this. Um, one way Gary did this um, study was with the chicken tractors in the corners, etc. But in commercial farms, when you use plastic culture, for example, what we have been doing is to, to transplant four blue hover squash to the ends of the rows. And at the same time, we are planting the seeds of the cash crop. So this picture was taken after a more or less a week after transplanting, after seeding the, the seed of the uh, cash crop. So you can see always the blue hovers are going to be bigger than the cash crop. And because they're super attractive, you will have most of the insects coming to those plants. So every row gets blue hovers. Every row gets four plants uh, at the ends of the row. And in this particular case, in 2013, you can see the picture, the eight trap crop plants planted at the ends of the rows, they were protecting 70 uh, squash plants, summer squash, which are also very attractive to, this, um, to these pests. It was very effective. For our research, we were counting insects, etc., which you don't have to do that. But if you are organic, you can kill them using um, organic insecticides. Yes. They were 120 feet long. That's what, that's what we did. And we have um, results from on-farm research, different farmers, other than Gary Benning, trying this in different ways. So there is different ways in which you can implement this uh, trap cropping system. So the one that I think is working very good for, uh, for commercial farmers, because these plants, they need to get fertilizer and they need to get the water. Sometimes it hasn't, they have been shown to work so well, but that is when you have them outside the rows and there is no water, there is no fertilizer, and the plants are very stressed and that's when they, they don't work. The key is that you have to kill, the, the key is that you have to kill the pest. Chicken tractors, organic insecticides, or conventional insecticides. If you don't kill the pest, they are going to kill the plants and they are going to move to your cash crop. This is a picture from the Lincoln University Carver uh, Farm in Jefferson City, Missouri. It shows very clearly the concept of trap cropping. Every row gets blue hover squash or red curie hover squash. Uh, Gary talked about that. You can see the size of the cash, the size of the cash crop compared to the size of the but not only that, we also have been doing, as part of the system, trying to integrate over crops, which is, for example, buckwheat as a way of bringing uh, beneficial insects, but very importantly, to bring honeybees. Because cucurbits, as you know, they require pollination. So if you can bring plants that can attract pollinators, you can increase yield. So what you see here is just sorghum sudan grass for wheat suppression. Every week, a person will mow this areas 
leaving this strip with the flowers. So what, what is working well is that when you are transplanting the, when you are seeding the cash crop, you can at the same time see the buckwheat because they're going to be blooming more or less at the same time. So this is just a mature, those are mature plants, it goes harvest time, and then, uh, well, it looks uh, pretty good. Then, again, for the number of years we have been doing this research, and Red Yuri Hobart has shown to be, in most cases, as good or better than Blue Hobart. The Blue Hobart plant grows very big, it's hard to control. One suggestion would be perhaps to use a trellis system where you can have them grow vertically, because it's also going to expose more um, surface area and wind to, to the insects, but, or you can prune the plants but keep adding seeds, so you can have always small plants um, around. And the, ca the cash crops, we have not spread them in five years at the university because there has not been an, any need. And this is just pictures showing the different ways we have done. Uh, this is the red cutie hover, smaller, it's like a pumpkin, beautiful plant. We have done on-farm research, organic, this is an organic farmer. Had a, a funding from the Garden Series Trust, a private foundation from the Midwest. They are mentioned in the website that they are doing trap cropping. This is the farm that 2012 they they had to burn half an acre of squash because they couldn't harvest due to squash bugs. They couldn't harvest. After implementing trap cropping in the last three years, they have been very successful. They have said that they have not grown better uh, squash uh, compared to what they did before with, without trap cropping. Jose Fonseca is a Hispanic farmer in uh, St. Peter's, Missouri. He has been um, implementing trap cropping since 2011. He has been using trap cropping even in his um, seedling production. He has a hoop house. When I met him, he will spray every week to kill the insects that will get inside the hoop house. That's where he had his seedlings and zucchinis. But the suggestion was to plant blue hobarts inside pots and then to bring these pots outside the, the coop house when there was activity, I mean, it was early May. And he will apply, not for organic farmers, but he will apply imidacloprid, a systemic insecticide, just to those blue hovers on the pots. And then he will not have to worry about anything for three or four weeks. So all, most of the insects that came to those um, to that area, they came to the blue hovers and they were killed by, by the plants, by the insecticide. And after 2011, he has not sprayed except for um, one spray that he did in 2011 in the field. He didn't have to spray, but we told them that there was a few insects, which is not economic threshold. There was no risk for the crop, but he was really, he really wanted to have a good night's sleep, and he, he sprayed. And I told him, you don't have to, but well, he told me that he did, I told him after later, said, you didn't have to spray because there was no need. But he sprayed, and so that because of that, he didn't, I cannot say that he was um, pesticide free, but for, that was 2011, 2012, 13, 14, and 15, four consecutive years, zero sprays to the zucchinis. So he's really happy because he's a, a urban farmer, he has a, a, a hospital, there is a daycare, and customers have been asking him, how do you control pests? Do you spray the, the crop? So now he can say that watermelon, all cucurbits, no sprays. And this is a statement from him. And also, it's very difficult to have a control when you do on-farm research. So basically, you could say, well, he controlled the pests because maybe there were not enough pests on the particular year. But on a phone call, and that was two years ago, he said, you know what, Jaime? I did trap cropping as usual because he already adopted the approach. I forgot to plant blue hovers somewhere in the farm, in one of these sections that he had in squash, zucchinis. He said, I forgot, and I was trusting that the blue hovers were working. When he, when he went to check those plants in that, in that section with no blue hovers, but he thought they were blue hovers, they were dead. So that's the control. So you don't have blue hovers in his case. He knows that he was he's going to kill the plants. There is more research uh, supported by Sir uh, Rusty Lee. Uh, he's uh, one of the largest uh, vegetable farmers in Missouri that I know, uh, not organic. And he also got support to, do, uh, scale, to scale up the use of track cropping. He has the whole perimeter row um, in plastic with blue hobarts, and those rows are large. Those are 600 uh, feet long rows. That's why he had two rows. The perimeter rows were with uh, blue hobart squash. He applied a systemic insecticide. He's conventional, he's an organic, but that's, that's, that's the flexibility. 
if you are organic, you can uh, use organic insecticides. We can discuss what is the most effective. Because if you use Entrust, which is Spinoza, you are not going to kill the squash bugs. Just the way they feed. Um, and Spinoza is more, well, we will discuss it. I don't want to see the five minutes. So basically, Rusty Lee presented at the Great Plains Conference in St. Joseph, that was two years ago. And this statement that he made to the farmers, I thought it was very important. He said, I eliminated two field scale sprays. And the, the next word that he says to me, that matters. And when I ask him, what do you mean by that? Is the cost savings, because he didn't spray and there is less uh, input. He said, no, Jaime, it's beyond the cost. It's not spraying, not killing bees, not, uh, I mean, uh, spraying the, the ground, etc." So that's all what I have to say, five minutes, and, and I just don't want to see the time. The question is whether blue hobart is susceptible to bacterial wilt. Yes, for trap cropping, you don't want to have a plant that is susceptible. There is another squash, which is the Turks turbant. It's very susceptible. It's attractive to these insects, but it's so susceptible that if they, if they feed, if they have the bacteria, they can tra transmit the bacteria to plants. Blue hobart is not susceptible. That's why it's very, very safe. Yeah, the, were the blue hobarts destroyed by the chickens? Uh, not really. They really didn't affect them like I, I thought they would because, you know, chickens get in your flower bed, they just scratch them all out of the ground and, and around tomatoes and stuff. But they really didn't affect the blue hubbards that much. They would, they would scratch around a little bit. It's the squash bugs that destroyed us. Yes, uh, what she's talking about is a system I have not tried yet, but I think this is a fantastic system. The, the guy that I know took uh, cheap plywood, cut it in two foot wide, eight foot strips, and you lay them out a few feet apart, and then each you let, let the bugs build up under those, and each day you flip over a couple, depending on how many chickens you have, you flip over a couple, let them eat those bugs, uh, and then, then you feed them, and then next day you move to the next couple and you just keep working down your pattern and back and it's amazing you, you just bring in hundreds and hundreds of bugs especially crickets and cockroaches and stuff and the chicken love June bugs uh, do you, can you use the chickens in the squash cop that you want to harvest they will peck the fruit we didn't care about or, you know the, the squash we uh, we didn't care about it so we didn't care if they pecked it apart in fact we were just using it as supplemental uh, but no, they'll destroy those. You're going to have to have a separate section just for the sacrificial plant. Well, yes, I can tell you. If you buy one pound of Spinoza, the previous formulation was that lost. Now it's a different formulation. It's very expensive. It's um, will be $600 a pound. But the active ingredient is 80% Spinoza. When you buy the Monterey and the ready to apply solutions, you, when you check how much Spinoza is in the, in the um, as an active, it's 0.5%. Basically, you're spraying water with a, well, of course, you're spraying water with, a, with just a tiny amount of Spinoza. So it's effective, but when you make the comparison, you are paying about four or five times more. Four or, four or five times more for the value of, of, for the amount of Spinoza per gram. So you're a commercial farmer, yes, Spinoza, the real formulation is, um, if you are buying the, the ready to use, basically you're spending more money. But if you have a small area, you, of course you're not going to buy the, the commercial formulation. Then Spinoza, again, is not going to kill squash box because squash box, the way they feed, is they in, insert the mouth part into the, into the stem. So they're not in contact with insecticide. So Spinoza is more effective when you have chewing insects, like cucumber beetles. Well, Biganix is expensive also, but you can buy small amounts. And I will use the highest rate because it's difficult to kill. Um, squash box, as you know, is very difficult to kill. There is another insecticide which is called Acera, A, Z for zebra, E, 
are a, a problem with that insecticide is that it's very expensive also. You need to buy one gallon. There is, it doesn't come in less than one gallon. And one, one gallon is $330. It, it, it combines two active ingredients. It combines biganic and also it, it has an acid acting, which is neem. So both together, is, they're more effective. Um, that would be a good idea, yes. If you have both separately, you can mix them, and yes, you can apply. But always apply the high rate to kill, in particular, the squash bugs. If you're using the beneficial insect crops, like I, I showed you with the millet and stuff, and the blue coverage, you do not, and you spray your blue coverage, do not spray your beneficial insect crops, because then you will kill the bugs and the bees and everything else. So you really have to keep those separate. And those have to be on the outsides of your garden. Don't ever put blue coverage in the middle of your garden, because then you're just bringing them all right into the middle. They, they uh, I mean, you tell you, bugs migrate in from the edge in. So you, the, the whole point of this is you stop them at the outside edge. I can add and to that in the flowers, of the blue cover, or the trap crops, they're going to attract honeybees, and they're going to attract the bumblebees and other pollinators. But that's when the buckwheat can help. Because if you have buckwheat, they, it's a way of diverting them to those plants. Or if you have a small area, you can pick the, the flowers so that there is no blooms. But if you spray, of course, you can spray at night. Just don't spray directly when there is activity by honeybees. And the, the high concern will be when you apply imidacloprid, so the whole plant becomes toxic, including the, the flowers. In that case, it's when I would suggest removing the, the flowers or having buckwheat so that the beans can go to those plants. And the imidacloprid systemic will be effective for four or five weeks. It depends. Organic insecticides, well, you have to spray more often because they're botanical or microbial. And then uh, spray at night. <laughs>